So we come now to Romans 7, 7 to 25, which builds quite uh, naturally off of what preceded. If you recall in Romans chapter 6, Paul made the somewhat shocking claim that sin will not rule you, you believers who, unlike the rest of the world, are not subject to the rule of sin and death. Why? Because you're not under law, but under grace. Hence, you're not under the Mosaic law, you're under the grace of God. And by that, he means to say, we were in the flesh. So here's this power of the flesh. And when we were in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law, this old Mosaic law is part of the problem, our sinful passions were at work in our members, that is our limbs, to bear fruit for death. We did naughty stuff. But now we are set free from the law, dead to that which held us captive. What held us captive? The Mosaic law, not just sin and death. The law was part of the problem. So now we are slaves not under this old letter, letter of the law, but we are slaves in the newness of the spirit. Okay, Paul, you have that conviction, that's fine, but what problem will you have to answer? What then should we say? That the law is sin? Sure sounds like you took us in that direction, Paul. You aligned the Mosaic law, the old letter, with the power of sin and death. And Romans 7, 7 to 25, is Paul's effort to exonerate himself of that charge. And in many ways in Romans 7, we will encounter some, some difficult, sort of intricate passages. So we want to make sure we pay attention to the main thing Paul's trying to achieve in this section, which is to assert, no, I didn't mean to say the law is sin. And although I said you used to be enslaved to the old letter, uh, and now we're in the spirit. I actually want to insist that the law is holy. And in fact, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And I can go one further. The law is spiritual. So although in Romans 7, verse 6, Paul contrasts the old letter and the new spirit. Here, Paul steps back and says, I, I don't actually mean to say that the Mosaic law is opposite of the spirit. The law is spiritual. It's a good thing. It just turned into something really bad. All right, Paul, how are you going to prove all of that? Again, the main thing he wants to prove in this chapter is the law is good, and he wants his readers to give thanksgiving for the liberation in Christ and to let the spirit, not the flesh, direct their lives. Let's look at this passage a little more closely and see why it's a challenge. What then should we say? So we finished chapter seven, verses one to six in the last lecture. We now come to the question that, that, that flowed naturally out of those. What should we say? The law of sin? Heavens, no. Here's why not. Sin, and remember, for Paul, this is a force. This isn't just people behaving badly. This is a power that enslaves people. It's outside of human beings. Sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment, sin killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. They're not to blame. But wait, you're saying then sin worked through this good thing to kill you? So the question that flows from this little discussion is, did what is good then bring death to me? No, 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 no. The law is not guilty for bringing death. It was sin working death in me through what is good. So why did this happen? In order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment, might become really, really sinful. 
So why did things happen like they did? Because God wanted to make clear that sin is really sinful, is really bad. So bad that it can even bring death through something good like the law. So we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly, sold into slavery under sin. Now, here we can already start to see that the person speaking here, that the, 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 the experience being described is a little hard to reconcile with what we would think Paul would say about his own experience, or frankly, the experience of any believers. Remember, just in Romans 7 verse 5, Paul said, we used to be in the flesh. Back when we were in the flesh, these bad things happened. But here, the person speaking says, I am of the flesh. And, and in general, Paul speaks of anyone joined with Christ as someone who's already dealt with the flesh entirely. So Galatians 5.24, whoever belongs to Christ has crucified the flesh with its passions. So you'd think that the person saying, I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. That doesn't sound like a person on the right column for Paul, not someone in Christ who's been set free from sin and death, the person who has been taken out of the flesh. So there's just one little puzzle that's already come up. We, we see why Paul is talking about this weak I, this I who is merely fleshly, sold into slavery. Because by speaking of the person that way, as being very weak, he's able to say, the law's good, but sin's bad, and I'm really frail. It's just hard to figure out what sort of person would make this confession. We're going to have to unpack who this speaker is in some more detail. So we move on to just the next paragraph, and... We need to pay attention to the way he parses the human person here. So Romans 7.15 and following. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So you can see that there's sort of two eyes at work here, two egos, two me's. There's an I that wants to do something. And I'm locating that around the head because that's the distinction Paul's going to make momentarily. But there's also a sort of comprehensive I. After all, the person who does naughty things is the overall, is the person. First, Paul wants to exploit the fact that we do things we don't want to do to show there's a dichotomy in the, in the human subject. So if I do things I don't want to do, some part of me is agreeing with the law, with the law that says what a person really ought to do. And so what is that part of the person that's making me not do what I want to do? Well, verse 17. It's no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I, some like good part of the person, I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I can't do it. I don't do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I don't want, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. He unpacks this sort of dichotomous human subject in even more detail in the following paragraph. And here we really want to pay attention to the anthropology he develops. He says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close in hand. I just want to pause and note here something I mentioned a couple lectures ago, 
namely that Paul exploits the semantic range of the Greek word namos, the word for law. And I'm not entirely sure why he does this. I don't know if he's trying to be clever or poetic or what. It frankly makes some of his discussions really very unclear. Um, so the word namos in Greek normally means law, just what we mean by law, principle, custom, rationality, rules. But Paul, uh, it, the Greek word namos can also mean something more like a principle. And more than once, Paul has expressions where it must mean something like a principle. So right here in this discussion of whether or not the law is sin or the law is good, Paul also decides to talk about a law that he finds in himself. In fact, two laws that he finds in himself. And some English translations will render this principle. So sometimes you'll find 721 rendered, I find it to be a principle that when I want to do good, evil lies close to me. We'll see that again. So verse 22, I delight in the law of God in my inner person. So we have an I who delights in the law, and we have an inner person that delights in, in God's law. So some part of this human being, who is fleshly, strangely, thinks the law is great and says, yay, hooray law, good, good instructions, good commandments. I'd love to do that. Verse 23, but I, true me, I see in my members, uh-oh, members is the word for limbs. It's the same word Paul uses when he says, we are all members of the body of Christ, or Christ's limbs. So I see in my limbs another law. Oh, good heavens, Paul, really? This must mean another principle. Another law, which is at war with the law of my mind. He adds a third term. And I'm just putting them all together. There's three terms for the good part of me, the I that likes God's law, that wants to do good. So verse 23 again, I see in my members a law at war with the law of my mind. And this principle or law in my members enslaves me to the law of sin, which dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from the body of this death, this mortal body? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God. But with my flesh, and he gives one more term here, I am a slave to the law of sin, the principle of sin, I guess. So, one of the first things you learn in New Testament studies and in an introductory class is that Greeks have a different way of thinking about the human person in general than. Jews or the Hebrews, and the sort of day one textbook distinction will be this. Jews have a holistic view, uh, not a mind-soul, uh, sort of a body-soul dichotomy, not a body-soul dualism, but a holistic view of the person. Yes, there's a nephesh or a soul, but it's more just your breath. And the Greeks have this idea of an inner person, uh, a psuche, a soul, that's the true you. That's maybe a useful dichotomy to begin with and sort of contrast Jewish thinking and Greek thinking, but it doesn't hold up well in general because Judaism for several centuries prior to Paul had drunk deep from the wells of Greek thought and you already find all sorts of Jewish texts which contrast an inner true person variously called the pneuma, the, the spirit or the soul or the mind and the body. And for what it's worth, if you go back to older Greek thought, you find the pre-Socratics think of the psuche, the soul, as a breath. But anyway, my, my, my reason for saying that is if you look at this passage, I would challenge you to resist the conclusion 
Um, how are you going to resist the conclusion that Paul develops sort of a classic Hellenistic split in the person? There's a real me, which is my mind, my inner man, and then there's my body with its members, with its body of death, with its flesh. And why is it so hard to do what I want? Well, because of my, it's my darn body. It's my flesh. That doesn't actually seem to be Paul's anthropology at other times. And anthropology here is a, a sort of a technical use of that word. It doesn't mean the study of people groups. When you're, when you're doing ancient history and ancient philosophy or, or systematic theology, the discussion of anthropology means what are the constituent parts of the human person? Is a person soul, spirit, and body? Is a person body and flesh? Are body and flesh different things? And again, usually people want to say Paul has a holistic view. The body is good. God redeems the body. And, and for Paul, the flesh doesn't mean physicality. The flesh means something like an evil force. But, and I, in, in other passages, that will hold up pretty well. But if you look at this passage, especially this, this final paragraph of chapter 7, what's Paul saying the problem is? The problem is the flesh. And in verse 24, he even calls the flesh the body, not just the flesh. Anyway, I don't think Paul's trying to develop a systematic anthropology here. I think he's mainly trying to show that the law despite the fact that he thinks it's on the wrong side of salvation history, that he's got a theology that can kind of salvage the goodness of the law. We want to pause a moment and think about a problem that Paul's dancing around here. He's talking about what? He's talking about a problem we all know, I do what I don't want. And this problem in the ancient world went under the label akrasia. And akrasia is the Greek word for lack of, it's the A at the beginning, krasia, self-control. This is the opposite of enkratia, which means self-mastery, self-control. And as I've mentioned in a prior lecture, enkratia, Self-mastery was the chief virtue in the ancient world, and Paul himself labels it as the foremost crowning fruit of the Spirit. The opposite of self-control, akrasia, is listed as one of those things that shows you're on the wrong track. It's like softness, one of the things that means you won't inherit the kingdom. This was a philosophical problem going back as far as Socrates. The philosophical problem is this. I don't want to eat that pink donut, but I just ate the donut. How do you parse a sentence like that? I don't want to eat the donut, but I ate the donut. Who, who's the I? What, what force overpowered you? How, do you? how is it possible to fail to do what you want to do? And in general, it seems like there's two possibilities. One possibility is that akrasia is an illusion, that there's really no such thing as akrasia. What that means is to say, you always do what you want to do. And so Socrates takes this stance, and throughout the ancient world, the Stoics were known for being on this side of the debate. You always do what you want to do because the soul is unified. There, it doesn't have different parts. Which means, now granted, Socrates knows people eat donuts when they don't want to. He doesn't, to my knowledge, address the donut problem, but there's plenty of examples. People are bested by things. They drink too much. They engage in sexual relations that they later regret. Uh, they're, they're mastered by their desire for sleep or food. These are sort of the, the classic ones that come up again and again in discussions of self-control. The desire for sleep, for food, for sex, for drink. Everyone wants to control those desires. The mystery is, why, when we want to control those desires, do we fail to? 
Socrates says it's because of false beliefs. So it's not that your belly got the better of your head. It's that when you eat that donut, it's because you think the donut will be good for you. Maybe you think that pleasure is the greatest good, and you forget that beauty and truth are the greatest goods. Maybe you think that honor is the greatest good, something like that. Just mention, this isn't a class on Hellenistic philosophy, but in these debates, you can see that if that's your view of it, it's impossible to do something you don't want. The way to get self-mastery is to work on your beliefs. So if you ever fall apart and eat that donut despite your diet, the problem was at some moment when donut hits lips, it's that you thought it would be better to have pleasure or you thought the donut would be good for you. And so what you always have to work on, this is the stoic therapy. The stoic therapy is work on your thoughts, have true beliefs, resist all the false ideas going about in the world. And the other main view of this classic debate about akrasia is represented by Aristotle and really became more the popular view, the view you'll get in, in plays and so on, and in drama and probably the man on the street. And that's to say that akrasia this failure to do what you want, stem from passions some inherent in the person. They might also say that the soul has distinct powers. There isn't really a single you. There might be an appetitive part of the soul, a soul part, part of the soul with appetite, or part of the soul full of anger and wrath. Error, sin, results from succumbing to these weaker parts of the person. So when you eat the donut, if you're an Aristotelian, or if you're a later Platonist, you'd say, it's because your belly got the better of you. Or the unruly part of your person, your spirit got the better of you. Now, the reason it's worth just noting that this was a famous debate in the ancient world that Paul seems to be entering into at some level is because uh, Language very similar to what Paul talks about, featured in the, in the case of Medea. So the story of Medea is, uh, Medea ends up killing her children, and she cries out at the fateful moment, and this was retold in multiple uh, dramas, but here I give you a, uh, a quote from Ovid's version. She says, O oh, wretched woman that I am, I see the better, and it's what I want, but I follow the worse. So Medea became this, people were obsessed with this story of she, how could someone do something awful even though she wanted to do something good? Euripides' drama called the Medea, she, she says, I'm overcome by evils. I know that what I'm going to do is evil but passion is stronger than my reasoned reflection. This sounds a lot like what Paul's saying in the end of Romans 7. I don't do the good I want, but the evil I don't want is what I do. Wretched man that I am. Now I mentioned Medea because it ties together a couple things here. One of the questions I raised at the beginning is, how can we really imagine that Paul is the speaker in Romans 7? Paul doesn't think he's sold under sin. He doesn't think he's fleshly. He doesn't think he does the evil though he wants to do the good. Paul is quite triumphant. Back in the old days, he was triumphant. When I used to be doing righteousness according to the law, I was blameless, he says in Philippians. And in the current state of affairs, he says, being in the flesh was a past thing. Christians have crucified the flesh. We're in the spirit. We live to God. He says, my old man's dead. So none, nothing in Romans 7 really sounds like Paul. So who is this I who can't get things right? And it's helpful to note that Paul is using a figure of speech described, well, the, the, whose technical term is a Greek word, prosopa poia. Prosopa poia 
means speech in character, literally poeia, making, and prosopon, a face or a mask or a character. I give a definition here from Quintilian, who writes a handbook for orators. And he actually uses the Greek word, even though he's writing in Latin. A bold form of speech is prosopa poeia. This means we display the inner thoughts of our adversaries as though they were talking with themselves. Now, we'll only carry conviction if we represent them as uttering what they may reasonably be supposed to have had in their minds. We put words into the mouths of appropriate persons. Prosopa. Now, it's ancient readers uh, were more alert to this sort of um, uh, figure of speech than latter-day readers have been. And Stan Stowers, in an important book on Romans called Rereading Romans, highlights all the different patristic interpreters, that is, the church fathers, who got to Romans 7 and just said, yeah, this is prosopa poia. This is Paul putting speech in the mouth of a certain type of person. The question is, who's speaking? So who is the person? And that will have some bearing on how Paul is telling his story of salvation history and what he's saying when he gets to chapter 8 about how successful living is supposed to work. Chapter 7 sounds like quite unsuccessful living. You're enslaved to the law, you're getting it wrong, you're fleshly, you can't do what you want. Oh, wretched person that I am. So who is this wretched person who's so miserable? Well, again, Perhaps the obvious thing to say would be it's Paul. After all, it says I. And although I think it is appropriate to think of chapter 7 of Romans as prosopa poia, as speech and character, I will note that in general, in prosopa poia, when ancient authors employ it, they identify a little more clearly than Paul does who the person speaking is. So for instance, you could be giving a speech or writing a letter, and you could say, let me tell you what the Persians are thinking right now. The head of the Persians is saying to himself, quote, if we invade Greece now, I think we'll be successful. You identify that you're now giving an imaginary quotation from the head of the Persians or whoever else it is. Paul doesn't do that in any really clear way. He doesn't say, what does the person struggling with the law say? So anyway, you, you could argue this is Paul talking. So it's just important perhaps to emphasize that what are, what are the passages, what, what are the details in Romans 7 that don't sound like they fit for Paul that well? Well, one of them is, I was once alive apart from the law. When in Paul's life would that apply? When was Paul alive apart from the law? He was he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was raised a faithful Jew. So that doesn't seem to apply very well. You might say, well, what about someone before his bar mitzvah? So that you're free of the commandment until you're 13 and you have your bar mitzvah. Maybe, but there weren't bar mitzvahs in the first century. And it's not clear that that's really plausible. All right, what else? I am fleshly. I've already mentioned this, but Paul speaks about being in the flesh as a condition in all believers' past. So he's just said in chapter 7, verse 5, back when we were in the flesh. Galatians 5, 24, those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh. Paul says, my old man is dead. My old man died on the cross. I was crucified with Christ. He lives in me. How can Paul, who says Christ lives in me, say I am fleshly? So that, these are various passages that don't sound like Paul. Paul says, I do what I hate in Romans. The speaker of Romans 7 says, I do what I hate. But of course, Paul says, according to the law, I was blameless, so he didn't used to do what he hates. Uh, so, sorry. So could this be a Christian living under law? This is a proposal popular since the Reformation. Luther and Melanchthon 
and more recently a great commentator on Romans, C.E.B. Cranfield, have held that this must be a Christian speaking. So Paul now entertains the possibility of someone who is of Christ, but who is sort of making the mistake of trying to approach God on the basis of law. Now, let's go back through some of the data and see if that works. I was once alive apart from the law. That, that could make sense. Uh, it's the person, this is, a, say, a Gentile Christian especially, who didn't used to be under the law and had a certain life. I mean, it also struggles a little bit because would Paul really say a, a Gentile was alive when they were apart from the law? Weren't they dead in all sorts of nasty sins? But maybe this is a Christian who's converted, been baptized, has the Spirit, and for a while enjoyed life apart from law, and then made the mistake of trying to live by the law. I don't know. It sounds a little too psychological. The real strength of the proposal that this is some sort of spirit-dwelt person talking is this business about rejoicing in the law, in my innermost person? And in fact, the very idea of a struggle, I do what I hate. I want to do the good. I agree with the law. I think it's a fair point to note that that sounds like a spirit indwelt person in, in Paul's way of thinking. So Paul's about to say in Romans 8, people who are truly in the flesh think the things of the flesh. They don't think in their mind, oh, I love the good. They think the things of the flesh. They have a mindset that is inimical to God and cannot submit to God's law. That's Paul's expression. That's people in the flesh. That's the fleshly mind. So when we come to Romans 7 and there's this struggle, this wish to do good, but inability to do it, could that really be anyone without the Spirit for Paul's way of thinking? I think that's a valid question. Um, it's, it's at least possible that, I don't know, that, that doesn't sound like an unregenerate person in Paul's system. I think, again, the hard passage is, I am fleshly. Paul has just said about everyone who's a believer, you used to be in the flesh. And Paul doesn't think of that as something that you might fluctuate between on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. Oh, on, on Tuesday, I was really having a great day. Uh, but you know what? I think I'm in the flesh today. I'm fleshly today. Paul would say, you, you were once in the flesh with all humanity, and then you got baptized, and you died with Christ, you rose with Christ. You are no longer subject to sin and death. You are not in the flesh anymore. So the speaker in Romans 7 doesn't really sound like a Christian. What are other options? What about Israel? I was once alive apart from the law. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death. What if Paul who often explores the story of salvation history and explains why God gave a law and what God's been doing with the Israelites and the Gentiles and so on. Paul often in Romans steps back and gives the big picture. What if now he speaks in the voice of Israel? Well, that passage works really well. I was alive apart from the law. That would be Abraham's progeny prior to the giving of the law. And the commandment came. And what does the commandment say? When Moses gives the law, he says, I put before you life and death. Choose life. But what happened? That good law resulted in death. So parts of Romans 7 could sound like they could be spoken by Israel. I rejoice in the law. Think of the Psalms. And Paul would certainly, certainly read the Psalms as the voice of Israel. The law is my light. I walk, in, uh, I walk at liberty because of the law. And yet I do what I hate. All those things could be spoken by Israel. Douglas Moo, a major commentator on Romans, thinks that, that, that the voice of Romans 7 is Israel, and there's a lot to say for that. 
I think what's a little bit hard is this language of um, I am fleshly. That starts to sound anthropomorphic, like you're talking about an individual human being, not a corporate people. Uh, I think this, this view that it's Israel really struggles with this final paragraph. I see in my limbs a war at law with the law of my mind. There's sin in my members. I have a body of death. There's one principle in my flesh. All those terms sound like parts of a human being. It's possible Paul's applying them metaphorically to the people of Israel, but it sure sounds like this isn't the cry of Israel, rescue me from this mortal body. This is the cry of an individual who can't do what he wants. What are other options? One that might initially seem unexpected is to contemplate that this is the voice of Adam. Now that shouldn't seem out of the question, given that Romans 5 devoted considerable space to Adam, contrasting Christ with Adam, and furthermore focused on Adam for one reason, to explain sin's entry to the world, and to explain how Christ is the antidote to what Adam's transgression brought about. So let's look at these verses in Romans and see if we could imagine these being Paul's effort to give voice to Adam. I was once alive apart from the law. Now that works pretty well. Adam was made to be immortal. When the commandment came, what would the commandment be? Thou shalt not eat. When the commandment came, sin came to life and I died. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Death entered the world through Adam and all. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death. How could he say the commandment promised life? Well, I guess in the sense that God said, hey, don't eat this, and if you don't, he'll have a good life. How about the rest of this quotation? For sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. That almost sounds like sin is lurking the way uh, sin's lurking at the door and weasels into the world through this commandment. A commandment came, and although it was meant for Adam's good, it resulted in his and everyone's death. Why? Adam transgressed, that let sin into the world, and boom, death. So Ernst Kazemann, one of the greatest commentators on the Book of Romans in the 20th century, thinks Paul here is giving voice to Adam. And, and to some degree, of course, this would be more broadly applicable because uh, all are in Adam, Paul says in Romans 5. So this would be the experience of anyone prior to what God accomplished in Christ. Why does this view not persuade more followers? The passages that it struggles to make sense of, would, some, some details would be things like, I wouldn't have known what it was to covet. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seized an opportunity in this commandment and produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Now, thou shalt not covet is from the Decalogue. In other words, it clearly refers to the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. And it just doesn't seem to fit that well to say, you know, Adam was somehow put to death by one of the Ten Commandments. Nor is it clear why Paul would even give this as an example. Like why, why, would, why wouldn't Paul just say, I was alive apart from the commandment, but then the commandment came, don't eat of the fruit. So, and finally, we know in Romans 7, what's opened this can of worms for Paul? He's talking about the Mosaic law. He's not really talking about God's instruction to Adam. So I don't think Adam will quite work. I don't think it can be Paul's personal experience. It can't really be a Christian at large, because Paul doesn't really think of people some days being in the flesh and some days not. It might work for Israel, but it sounds an awful lot like a human being's body. 
I like the law in my mind, but my flesh says something else. So if we fail at all of these, perhaps we need to say, are we asking the wrong question? I'm not sure it is the wrong question, but I do think there's real wisdom. And I began uh, with the quotation of Niels Dahl here. So Niels Dahl says, on the one hand, the I, the speaker, this I is no doubt stylistic. That is, we can't press it and say like this is just Paul saying, giving his autobiography. It's partly a style meant to be sort of every man, meant to be just an imaginary speaker. But Dahl goes on. In some sense, both the speaker and the audience must be able to identify. So it's got to have a little bit to do with Paul and a little bit to do with what others would experience. Dahl goes on, and here I give the direct quotation. Paul does not use the I form to give, a bio, to give biographical information. Okay, so we don't have to press every detail and see if it fits Paul's experience. Nor to set forth anthropological doctrines. So we don't need to mine this chapter for Paul's exact explanation of what the constituents of the human being are that keep the human being from successfully executing the good. Or to give an abstract interpretation of pre-Christian existence under law. Paul wants to engage his readers. He wants them to, like an audience at a good sermon, sort of start shuffling in their seats so that they concur, so that they say amen, when Paul concludes the law is good. So that's, that's the big one. And there's just no question Paul is setting up the speaker, setting up the problems so that he can explain why the law is actually good, even though in human history the law has been the source of bad. So that they will concur with the conclusion and so that they will concur in the thanksgiving for the liberation in Christ, who will save me from the body of this death. Thanks be to God, who saves us through Christ. And furthermore, and here I don't know if I totally agree with Dahl, but this is what Paul should have been doing. To urge the readers to let the spirit, not the flesh, direct their lives. Well, that is certainly what the subsequent chapter, what Romans 8, is all about. So, I think we'll just have a quick look at how Romans 8 flows in, in many ways seamlessly out of the way Paul has set up the problems in Romans 7. Paul begins Romans 8 by saying, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God who rescued us. There's no condemnation. For the law of uh, for the for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. So there's the movement. In Christ, the law of the spirit of life has set you free of the law of sin and of death. Now, we seem to be maybe getting law used in still a third way. Sometimes it means Mosaic law. Sometimes it means Paul sees a law in his members, a principle. And now we have a real exegetical conundrum. What does it mean to say, Christ set you free from the law of sin and death? Is that saying that the Mosaic law is a sinful and deadly law? Well, that's how Paul set up the dichotomy earlier. You used to be under this old law. Now you're free. But we saw that the whole point of Romans 7 was to try to avoid that kind of conclusion. So maybe he means he set you free of the principle of sin and death and has brought you into a principle of life in Christ Jesus. For, I'm continuing to read Romans 8, 3 now. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, 
God condemned sin in the flesh. So this trio of bad forces, sin and death and flesh, were dealt with because God sent Christ in the likeness of sinful flesh and condemned them all, which means there's no condemnation on the believer who's in Christ. This is so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And Romans 8 will go on to try to dwell, uh, to distill what that means, to set the mind on the Spirit and to not set the mind on the flesh.